So for today's quick tip, we are going to square up these two vices on this Haas TM1 mill. I discovered that I had moved this vise from a different location for a quick job uh, where I needed both vices on the table and I did not square up this vise correctly at the time. So today I'm going to square it up and show you how to do it. All right, so what we're gonna use is a indicator and this basically has a lever probe and when you push on this probe, the dial on the indicator changes uh, from plus or minus 15 thousandths of an inch. So you can see on the body of the indicator there are these dovetail mounts. So a little V shape on each side and they're all over the indicator for various different mounting schemes. There's one on the back. And what we are going to use is this Indicol, not sponsored. Let me see, you can see the reflection there. And what this does is it will mount our indicator onto the little pinching dovetail tip like so and you you slide the dovetail into the dovetail clamp which can be a little tricky and then you tighten the knurled screw down to clamp your indicator in place like that and then you can articulate it in various ways to get the correct orientation. And on the other side, there is a clamp that clamps onto this diameter of a spindle, which goes all the way back to like the old Haas knee mill diameter. So if you look here, we've got, this is a Bridgeport clone mill. Let's zoom out. So it's, this is like an old uh, Bridgeport style knee mill. And this clamp, is designed to clamp onto this diameter, which exists on a lot of mills, or on tool holders. There's kind of a legacy diameter here so that this indicator can clamp on and then you can spin your spindle around and this indicator spins around. Well, on the tool holders for the Haas, there is a similar diameter, probably for the legacy of this, uh, this clamp and this diameter to all work together. So if we look at this, Cat 40 tool holder in the Haas spindle. I will release the tool manually. And this diameter is the same diameter as what we just had on that knee mill. And it works with that Endicol clamp. So we'll put this tool holder back. And we'll hit the, the clamp button. So we will use this diameter to clamp our indicator onto the spindle of the mill. Like that. And then we can spin it around as we want. So here, now this indicator can spin around and you can do things like check the tram or the perpendicularity of your spindle to the table. But today we are going to use this indicator to check the squareness of our vise fixed back jaw to the table, or more specifically, the, the x-axis of the mill. Okay, so I got you zoomed in on the dial indicator. And again, as we push on this, can this, this lever on the bottom, you'll see the dimension change on the indicator. You want the indicator probe lever to be, I think it's like 15 degrees off of perfectly uh, uh, vertical. Uh, if, obviously, if your lever gets too far swung back or forward, Oh, and by the way, this lever is intended to be adjustable. You know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your lever and your, and your ball tip is basically 90 degrees to the position that you're measuring, uh, nothing happens. It's difficult to get it to move. So you want to be within 15 degrees. So this isn't an absolute measurement, but it's, it's showing you uh, the relative motion uh, as a function of the, of the low angle on your indicator ball and lever. So now, using the mill controller, I'm going to bring the vise up to the ball, and I can lower the Z down as well, until we touch. And uh, I ran out of travel here. As you can see, we didn't quite hit the ball yet. So I'll back the, the Y axis up, and then I can move this, this holder that's still clamped to the spindle 
I can adjust this arm such that we get contact with our indicator. Like that. So now you can see each click of the mill, DRO and manual motion control uh, that we are moving 100 microns or approximately four thousandths of an inch. So I'm going to, using the mill controller, I'm going to set the needle to zero and now I'm going to move the, the mill table with the two vices bolted on it in the x-axis and we'll see how our uh, needle moves. If the needle doesn't move, then that means that we are squared up to the, to the x-axis of the mill relative to the spindle of the mill. So let's move it now and see what happens. And you can see that the needle is drifting off from the zero location. At the other end, you can see how the needle kind of stopped moving. And a good trick to do is to just gently touch the indicator to see if you're off of travel. And we are. So I push the indicator this way and I start to see motion. But when I tap it this direction, I don't see any motion. So that means that I'm not really getting a true reading out there. So we will move back to the other end and then we'll start to see the needle begin traveling about middle of the vise. So let's go all the way back. And now when we're here, back at our zero, I can wiggle this indicator and you can see how we're moving both directions. So that tells me that I don't have enough travel in the indicator to fully understand how far off this vise is. So I am going to move further in. So that's one whole rotation, so that's 30 thousandths. And you can see we were basically only engaged five thousandths on the indicator. So let's go to 15 thousandths. And then we can spin the, the crown of our indicator and then say that's zero. So that's another way of setting the zero on your indicator. Instead of using the mill, you can also just spin this, this crown to move your zero to where the needle is. Now we will move across. And before we stop touching there, but now we can do a full read on the face. And we are approximately like eight thousandths out of square on this, on this vise. So let's zoom out and we will start the process of knocking this vise into square. Okay, so the next step here is once we got our first dimension relative to our corner that we're going to define as this corner of the back fixed jaw of the vise. We want to loosen the bolt and rotate our vise around such that our needle goes back to the zero position that we measured from this corner that we're going to try to call our pivot corner. And I've got a 7 8 socket here because when you got two vices side by side it's kind of hard to get a wrench in here. So I'm going to loosen this side and I didn't have it very tight because I know that I had moved this, this vise. But what I'm going to do is finger tight this, this nut, uh, this half 13 nut that that's goes down into a, a T nut which is then affixed into the T slot of the mill itself. And I'm going to get a rubber mallet. So using this, this dead blow rubber mallet, we are now going to tap the front corner of the, of the vise. And ideally or theoretically the vise is generally going to pivot on this tight bolt on the other side of the vise until we see our needle go back to zero. And I find it's easier to actually tap this direction to rotate the vise as opposed to trying to, to whack right here uh, because really what you're doing is rotating the vise. Uh, you're not super in interested in the XY location of the vise, but we are going to be for the second vise because the idea is that the back jaw, fixed jaw of this first vise is going to be coplanar with the back fixed jaw of the second vise over here if you want to use both vices. The reason to, to use both vices is you can clamp a long piece of stock between both of these vices and they act as one big vise, which is usually pretty convenient. So I'm going to tap and our needle is back to zero. So now we're going to check out to see how square our vise is with just this first round of tapping. And the left bolt is still only finger tight. 
but we'll see what we got. And now our zero has drifted a little bit. So this plane is, is not rotating on a pivot point that's at this corner. The pivot point is actually over here. So if we, if we roll the vise around, then we're actually moving this surface back a little bit since we're pivoting at the, at the tight nut. So we will adjust our zero again. And I'm using the mill. You can also adjust uh, by turning the crown and moving the zero relative to the needle. But I find it's easier just to use the mill to reset your zero so that you're not uh, inadvertently obstructing the, um, the repeatability of your holder of your indicator. Okay, so we'll zoom back in on our numbers. And then I will move an X back across and we will sweep this, this fixed jaw of the first vise again and see how our number is changing. And you can see, basically, since we adjusted zero here, one and a half thousandths, then now we're one and a half thousandths off on our, on our pivoting side of the vise. So we're gonna give it a few more taps on the side to set that pointer back to zero. And we are still tapping in the same direction. And we repeat this process a few times until we can sweep the indicator back and forth on this fixed jaw and not see the needle change. So let's do that. So we'll go back to our zero and we should see ideally no movement in the needle. We'll go back again. There are a few little dings on the steel surface of this vise which I should actually stone down because that can cause errors as well. Like right right here, you see a little bit of a, a 1,000th difference. So I'm actually gonna stone that off or file it and then stone it off so that I don't see any, any defect there. That, that's, that probe is probably dropping into a groove and then coming back out, but I'll double check that with a file. But excluding that one little tick mark, our vise looks to be pretty square. Let's go back again, and, and you basically go back and forth a few times, and you iterate into the final squareness of your vise. Kind of walking around the camera tripod to look straight on at the indicator, and yes, we are good. All right, so now I'm going to retighten our vise with our socket head, and we want to watch this needle to see if, if it's changing as we tighten down the vise. And usually it does change a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna start tightening down a little bit out of frame, and we'll see if our needle on the indicator changes. And you can see there it moved a little. Some of this is me pushing against the, the y-axis of the mill, just in the act of tightening this bolt, or tightening this nut. So you can see every time I push with my body, I'm actually adjust, or pushing against the y-axis of the mill, and it's pushing back against me with the motor. But when I'm done and I let go, you can see how our zero hasn't changed, which is good. Of course, my socket's kind of stuck on there a little bit. There we go. I'm gonna reach around and tighten the other side. And now I'm pulling the stage towards me, and you can see every time I tug, that needle is pulling but then the mill brings it back to the right location. Okay, we'll do one last check on square. And we shouldn't see the needle move other than that little tick mark, which I'll check later. <laughs> okay, so do a final check on this first vise using the higher mag camera. And you'll probably see when we hit that little tick mark how we get a little, a little jump. So we'll fix that actually right now. And then moving along, we don't see any other change in the needle. I like to use the actual fixed base of the vise as opposed to the removable jaw that you put on there because the vise back is a little more accurate except for my little ding. <laughs> than a, a, a vice jaw which could be warped or if it's a soft jaw it, it could have all sorts of issues with it. 
So I got a little stone here that we can use to clean up that nick mark. And you can see the shiny crown around it. So whenever you ding a piece of metal, whatever the negative impact is, that because of conservation of volume, uh, what, however deep your ding goes in, that same amount of metal heaves up around the outside. So you got to basically file off the crater wall <laughs> that you've created. And we're using this, this stone here to do that. Actually, my grandfather had, I inherited this. This stone's about 100 years old. <laughs> and it's got an interesting radius set up on it. Okay. Now we'll move our indicator back across our little high spot there and see if we clean it up at all. Yeah, so we're dropping into that ding and then we're coming back out but we don't see it go over zero anymore so it goes in and out maybe scan past that a little more and then we can also confirm that it's negative by pushing on the needle temporarily to see that positive the needle goes clockwise and negative direction the needle goes counterclockwise so as long as that ding is below the surface but doesn't rise back up on each side, we filed off the crater wall that we created with that ding. Okay, there we go. So now what we're going to do is move our indicator over to the other vise and bring the surface of the second vise to be coplanar and square to the surface of the first vise, which we also squared up to the mill axis. So we should, if we're perfect, this needle should go to zero, and we're definitely not perfect. But you can see how our needle isn't really changing once we engage the second vise surface. So that means that our second vise is square, but it's not coplanar with our first vise. It's off by about 10 thousandths. So now we have to basically move this second vise forward but not actually change its angle. But as soon as we loosen this vise up, the, all the angles are, it's gonna be floating, so we gotta re-square and make it coplanar to our first vise. So let's uh, loosen up our bolts here. I got two different bolts on this particular one. Oh, I had that tight. There we go. Yeah, it's good to tighten these down when you're ready to machine so that you don't have drift occurring over time as you're machining. Or another way of looking at it is if you're prone to crashing your mill a lot, then maybe having your vise a little looser, but not really loose, will give you a little bit of a cushion when you crash or break a tool or something. Okay, so this vise should be basically free to slide around on our mill surface and our indicator is moving already so we are going to lift the indicator out and then I like to use a piece of stock like a, a, a straight bar stock to clamp between the two vices and that will basically drift this this vice into pretty close squareness to the first vice and coplanarness to the back surface actually I'll just go with this three inch steel bar and we're gonna clamp the, the bar first in our, in our lined up vise that we just dialed in, and which will set our, I guess, our plane of the back surfaces of the vices. And I am going to clamp this thing down. So right now, the floating part of the vise is pushing this steel bar against the fixed back jaw of the vise that we just dialed into the mill. So when we go back over, in fact, I think I'm gonna make sure that we're tight. I'm gonna double check tightness. Because 
what we're going to wind up doing is now we're going to clamp the second vise onto this bar and this clamping action is making sure that our vise is, is free to move. Like I'm going to knock it out of square actually. When we clamp this second vise down onto this bar which is referenced on our dialed in first vise, the second vise is going to find its, its coplanar position and be kind of square. So let me zoom in. Okay, you can see our second vise is just kind of all over the place like so. And then when I tighten it down, you'll see that it will roll itself into squareness with the first vise, just like that. Hopefully you saw that. And now what we're going to do is I am going to lock down this, this center screw again, or this center half 13 bolt. And this is a three quarter inch wrench. I, don't, I, I can't fit a socket wrench down in there, so I got to do the kind of the laborious way of locking this one down. Okay, that feels good. Okay, and now I can loosen both vices and get this bar out of here because the bar did its job. So it, it brought the second vise in kind of square to the first vise uh, using the, the rigid and planar aspect of this bar, which isn't a perfect bar. So we're still going to have to dial in the second vise a little bit to get down to a thousandths accuracy or 25 micron accuracy. So we'll pull this guy out. Now our dial indicator, I haven't really moved at all since we were touching off on the first vise, so we can see how close our fixturing of this second vise with that steel tube got us into the zero location that we set on the first vise on the far edge. So there you can see that we are about three thousandths off from our uh, first vise. And we can confirm that our indicator hasn't moved relative to our first vise. So I'm going to move this guy back over. And our indicator should go back to zero, which it does, but it's one thousandths off. So let's, let's come across. And there, there it's actually holding zero pretty good. It is possible that you can, you can nudge your first vise out of square. That's why you want this one to be really tight and that one really loose. But uh, yeah, it looks like we're still off by about half a thousandths. So I might, I might bump this vise a little more. So I'm whacking the, the front corner of this vise off camera. Let's see if we can get it back to zero. And um, I'm hitting this vise with the, with the bolts being pretty tight, not finished tight, but pretty, pretty close to being fully tight. Is remaining square. Okay, and it is. So now we're going to travel over to the second vise, which we roughly squared using that steel pipe. And we will see how we are looking. I'm going to travel across. Okay, you can see that the far end of our vise is actually coplanar. That point or that corner of our second vise is coplanar with the plane of our first vise, which is pretty convenient. So since this zero matches the zero of our first planar back of the first vise, that means we don't really need to translate this side of the vise forward, but we can roll the vise. And maybe if we're lucky, we can roll this face into square with our first plane. So I'm going to travel back to the other, the other corner of our second vise that we roughed in with that steel pipe and I'm going to start tapping on this side. Okay, now if we're lucky and I travel the vise to the other side of or to the other corner on the second vise and it still says zero, then I think we're pretty much done. So we'll scan across or sweep across the second vise. And it looks like our needle is not moving, so that's good. And then we can take this indicator over to the first vise and make sure that we're still on zero on the first vise. I like to roll off the edge of the vise a little slowly to understand how the needle's gonna behave. 
you know, because you don't want to go like a full revolution on your indicator and then be off by 30 thousandths. So we'll come over and hopefully this needle will, will climb back up onto the second vise and then return to the zero. And it did. And then we can sweep across the second vise and it looks like we are still coplanar on both vices and square to the x-axis of the mill. So that's good. It's also a good idea to roll off the edge of your vise to make sure that your indicator is actually touching. So we'll go across again and we'll ease off to track the needle. And I'm at point, or uh, what is it? Um, 0.1 millimeters or 4,000 steps on the mill. So you can see how we're rolling off the edge. And we'll come back over again just to double check. And we are back on zero. So both vices are now lined up to each other. So now I can put a big piece of stock across both vices and machine a larger piece that normally wouldn't fit in one vice and know that basically both vices act as one. So which is kind of nice. It's also good if you've got a, um, an irregular edge on the front side of the mill that you can actually close the vices to different depths and have the back edge that we just indicated in as our reference uh, datum for the part. Okay, well that's about it. And I'm going to tighten these bolts down and make sure nothing moved and then we are done with lining up two vices and squaring them together and coplanar on a single mill. Okay, so it's been about a month later and I double checked these vices and we're still square, so that's good. A few extra tips that I'd like to point out regarding squaring up vices on a mill is that since you've got two vices, you would, it's really best to have the height of the base of the vise to be the same. Now, typically like for like curt vices or other relatively good vice manufacturers. They make all their vices to be the same height. It's like a, you know, like it's, a, it's a, a number that you paid the money to get equal heights on. But it is good practice to make sure that the beds of both of your vices are coplanar as well. You can either measure the height, you know, this height from where the base of the vice is on your table to the sliding deck or you can use your indicator and if you need to, you can shim one or the other vise, you know, a big sheet of shim underneath your vise. You can get shim down to about half a thousandths or about 12 microns. And if you can't get it better than that, then maybe you shouldn't use two vises. Another th thing to consider is that sh the bottom of your vise is a precision surface. So you want to take very good care of it. You'd, Usually when I take a vise off of the mill table, I'll set it on its side so the bottom face is not sitting down on something hard that can ding the bottom of the vise, similar to that, that ding mark that we had to stone out on the back face of the vise. If you do have little ding marks, then get a stone and clean off the bottom of your vise. And it's also good practice to stone the surface of your mill as well, which I didn't show in this procedure, but I kind of did with that little ding that we saw. You also need to clean the vise bottom and the top of your mill very well. Um, you know, a piece of dust is about a thousandth of an inch thick. So any kind of particles or chips or dust or any other contamination can throw off the accuracy of your vise as well. So the mill table and the bottom of your vise are both precision planes that you want to keep clean and uh, ding or burr free. Another nice thing about having two vices is that you can use one vice as a hard stop for your second vice. So this is just a piece of scrap aluminum that we have in the vice. So you can see this setup, how this, this piece of aluminum is, is clamped into the first vice so that we've got a, a hard stop if you're, if you're doing multiple parts on a, on a production run. Other tricks is that you can clamp your back parallel into your second vice by loosely tightening your, your um, your springy material like this this piece of aluminum. Uh, this vise has actually got this aluminum clamped but not fully down, you know, because we don't want to push this vise off off of axis that we just set up. But it's nice you can you can kind of 
you can retain your one of your parallels in the in the second vise with this hard stop as well as a parallel clamp which is kind of cool if you're going to use if you're going to straddle your part across both vices you do want to make sure that you've got matched parallels you know you want to make sure all these thicknesses are the same so i think that's about it i'm sure if uh, there's other tips that people have please put them in the comments below for other viewers to see and thanks for watching <laughs>